A very warm welcome to worship on this fifth Sunday of the season of Pentecost. Welcome to Grace Church on the Hill in Toronto, wherever you may be. I uh, hope you are well here where our vaccination rates are going up and life is opening up. It's my privilege today to welcome the Reverend Lynn Yule Marshall as our preacher this morning. Lynn was ordained in this diocese some years ago and served, but has in the past 15 years been in the Diocese of Virginia. So she's just recently returned to Toronto and to this neighborhood around Grace Church. So we welcome Lynn today. With the humidity and heat, she, she should be familiar with this from uh, the Diocese of Virginia. I'm also thankful to Dean Douglas Stout for being our presider today, accompanied by our deacon, Micah. All right. I want to thank Whitney for being our cantor this morning, and I'll ask her now to lead in our opening hymn, O Worship the King. Welcome to Grace Church. 
It's wonderful to see people returning to church, being able to return to church, and the pews uh, starting to fill. Uh, we're aware that it is not just us, but one thing that the pandemic has shown us is that we're members of a very large community. And it is through uh, events like this where people join in from across the globe, from Australia, the UK, the Caribbean, and across Canada and the United States, that we are part of a large family. We do so on the amid, virtually a midsummer day, just after the second quarter days. There are four quarter days that punctuate the church's life and used to punctuate the life of, the, of, of, the, of your area, your city, your town. The first quarter day was on the Feast of the Annunciation on the 24th of March. The second quarter day on the 24th of June, which we have just finished, the Feast of St. John the Baptist. The third quarter day, of course, will be uh, the, uh, in, in the Feast of St. Michael and All Angels on the 24th of September. And then, of course, on the 24th of December, on the eve of Christ's Nativity, is the fourth quarter day. It's lovely to remember that our lives are tied in to that rhythm, uh, and this is how we gather uh, this morning. Blessed be the one holy and living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, God, you have taught us through your Son that love fulfills the law. May we love you with all our heart, all our soul, 
all our mind and all our strength, and may we now love our neighbors as ourselves. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. A reading from the second book of Samuel. After the death of Saul, when David had returned from defeat in the Amalekites, David remained for two days in Zitlag, where he intoned this lamentation over Saul and his son Jonathan. He ordered that the Song of the Bow be taught to the people of Judah. It is written in the book of Jashar. He said, your glory, O Israel, lies slain upon your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon. The daughters of the Philistines will rejoice, and the daughters of the uncircumcised will exult. You mountains of Gilboa, let there be no rain upon you, nor bounteous fields. For there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul anointed with oil no more. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, nor the sword of Saul return empty. Saul and Jonathan, beloved and lovely, in life and in death, they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. O oh, daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you in crimson, in luxury, who put ornaments of gold upon your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan lies slain upon your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Greatly beloved were you to me. Your love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen, and the weapons of war perished. The word of the Lord. And he shall redeem Israel from all their sins. 
A reading from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Now, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter I am giving my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something. Now finish doing it, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need, in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. The Word of the Lord. with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus, 
and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The Gospel of Christ. Let us pray, Holy Lord, may thy word only be spoken and thy word only be heard. Amen. Please be seated. I thought perhaps you might be expecting a, a Virginia accent this morning, um, but mine is a sort of a little bit of British and a little bit of Canadian and maybe a tiny bit of Virginia, so it's a bit of a mishmash. <laughs> I wonder if you've ever woken in the night and been un unable to get back to sleep. Perhaps you've been woken by the cry of a child, a noise from outside, or the noise going on inside one's head. Whatever the reason, it seems at times as if the worries and the doubts and the fears, the things one has to do and not to do, the things one has done and not done, creep into our minds. And slowly sleep departs as layer upon layer upon layer brings us into full consciousness. The psalm for today is Psalm 130, and it speaks into the wakefulness, the tossing and turning of mind and body, watching the hours crawl by. The psalm begins from a place of darkness, a cry of the heart that ends with a cry of the land, a voice crying from the depths, from the deep, and in great distress. The Psalms are not short on vigorous language, and the language in this morning's Psalm is quite beautiful. Psalms have, Psalms, as you know, praise and lament and even cursing and crying for help. But I wondered about the translation this morning, so beautifully sung for us, but still, let your ears consider well the voice of my supplication. If you, Lord, were to note what is done amiss, who could stand? Maybe it's that word amiss. It sort of brings to me ideas of old English mystery shows. Something is amiss. 
And when I thought of cries of help from the deep, I was reminded of an incident when I was a very young child. Um, I grew up in Warwickshire, sort of in the middle of England, and our family was on a fishing trip um, in the local streams that, that ran. And leaning over on one of these trips, leaning over the water to see a flower that was so beautiful that I wanted, I fell into the water. Now my family claim it was only six inches deep. But to me, it felt like I was sinking down, sinking down. And you can be sure that my cry was somewhat more intense than something is amiss. I believe I hollered quite loudly. And then pondering this, it got me thinking about how we approach God in prayer. Do we clean up nicely? get the language sorted, put on our best clothes and our best attitude? Or do we, as so many of the psalmists do, yell and holler knee-deep in mud? Maybe in those sleepless nights, we're not always as cleaned up as we'd like to be, waiting for the dawn, tossing and turning, through tears and in fear, waiting and hoping, finding no comfort. There are, of course, many reasons why we lie awake at night. But in this psalm, the speaker is talking specifically about sin, their own, and toward the end of the psalm, the sin of the people of Israel. Israel, wait for the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy. So first, the recognition of sin, the cry of repentance, the cry for mercy, in the belief that God does indeed hear. If you, Lord, should mark our iniquities, who could stand? The answer clearly, no one, not one. Who of you would throw the first stone? Not one. For those of us who have lain awake, deeply troubled by something, waiting perhaps for that solitary cry of the blackbird before the dawn's early light, wading through the watches of the night with the watchman, time drags on. The watchman, I'm sure you know, was set to keep watch as people slept, to watch for danger so that they could wake and warn. Though Israel's watchmen came in for criticism sometimes as they slumbered, but sometimes it was the prophets through God spoke, who warned Israel. All are warned, then and now. Be alert, watch out, your enemy like the lion is prowling. My mind went to think about our Lord in the garden of Gethsemane. Who would stay awake and watch with him? Well, no one. In the Christian hour this morning, Micah and I pondered the parable of the lost sheep, and we used the version from Luke. And I recall hearing a sermon by an African-American preacher when I was at a conference in Chicago. And he used that parable, but he used it for Matthew. And Matthew has a slightly different emphasis. The sheep has wandered off, but been, been led astray. And I love the way that the preacher presented this particular parable, so I steal from his content. He say it begins with a glance. Surely the grass is a little greener on this side. So maybe a, a, just one step. And the eyes are off the shepherd and on the grass. And then another step. We're lost. We may not even realize, but then the night closes in. And now comes that cry from the depths. I never meant this to happen, but it does happen to all of us. And maybe sometimes we need that wake-up call. Maybe it's in the night when we wake from sleep. Perhaps we're a little more receptive. That grass really wasn't that green over there, you know. 
And then maybe we call things that we've done, we wished we hadn't said, we wish we hadn't. And certainly that is the time to cry out to God. Because the psalmist is right, who of us could stand if we were judged according to our sin? But what he is assured of, what we can be assured of, is there is forgiveness. We are not left hopeless and helpless and lost, wandering around in the dark. We don't have to let those things burden us and keep us awake at night. In his word is my hope, or perhaps more accurately translated, I hoped for the Lord. My being, my being hoped for his word. And I waited. For light in the darkness, I waited. For the word made flesh, I waited. Jesus the Christ, I waited. And we're reminded in this parable that we, that we uh, looked at with Micah. The sheep have never wandered too far away that the shepherd can't find them. In our psalm, the psalmist cries, For there is forgiveness with you, Lord, therefore you shall be feared. And in this case, that fear of the Lord is more of awe and reverence rather than terror, although that might be appropriate at times. The psalmist cries out for themselves and for their community. And you know, there's all sorts of reasons why we wake up late in the middle of the night. It could have something to do with what we ate. But it might be grief or loss, loss for ourselves, loss for the freedoms that we've, we've lost during this last year, loss for our loved ones, for our church, for our history. And we can cry it to God and we can shout. We don't actually have to be polite, you know. We can scream, though maybe you want to find somewhere where we're not going to disturb the neighbor and we can whisper, we can yell, and we can hold God responsible, and we can wait, seek his face. I heard someone speak about their experience when they were going through a very deep depression. He didn't speak of seeking the face of God, but sitting in the darkest of places one night, it was as if he could hear breathing. And what he believed was that it was God breathing. For him, he needed that. That was grace and the beginning of his healing, of climbing out of that pit. It was what he so desperately needed, to know that he was not alone. Because we are not alone in it, whatever situation we're in, however dark it looks. The psalmist knew that. We can be assured that God is listening. Ellen Davis, Professor Ellen Davis, wrote a wonderful book called Getting Involved with God. And I uh, confess a little bit envious because um, our deacon Micah actually studied where Ellen Davis taught at Duke. She is a wonderful speaker and it's a beautiful book, Getting Involved with God. And she says, God cares that I am in pain and can be expected to do something about it. God can be expected to do something about it. She's, this is remarkable assumption when you think of it, which we hardly ever do, she said. That the God who made heaven and earth should care that I am hurting, should care that you are hurting. Because nothing we can do will separate us from the love of God. But it doesn't preclude pain. It doesn't preclude pain. It doesn't always end as the gospel with that healing. Although remember that woman who was healed 13 years. I watched an interview a couple of nights ago with an aunt waiting to hear if her family had survived the collapse of the apartment building in Miami. She had a picture of this beautiful family which she held up on her phone. Only God can save them, she said. He does miracles. Yes. And another who understood that too, but also understood that if they didn't make it, that they would be in the arms of Jesus. Because <laughs> death doesn't have the last word. The night ends and the dawn breaks. But the Psalms teach us to pray. They teach us to pray. 
We find in them lament. With my tears I melt my mattress. And then the cursing. Set over a wicked man, let an opponent stand at his right hand. May his days be few, may his children wander around and beg. Well, now that's not something you expect to hear on a Sunday morning, is it? But there it is in the Psalms. It might be useful when you're driving on the 401, but we don't stay there. But there are days, aren't there? And there's rejoicing. Psalm, one, Psalm 30, I exhort you, O Lord, for you pulled me up. You turned my mourning into dancing. And there's praise. We praise God, writes Davis, in order to see the world as God does. The psalmist, he says, are always aware that survival in this difficult world depends entirely on the slender thread of prayer and covenant faithfulness that binds us to God. Out of the depths have I called to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. The Psalms aren't clean and neat, and neither are we. They speak into our messy, broken, wonderful human lives. They're our prayer book. We can use them. We can use them when we cannot find the words to say. canticle that we heard this morning ends with your tender love like early dawn heralds the day of endless peace the darkness of death's shadow fades your justice reigns and will not cease weeping may linger for the night but joy comes with the morning amen Let us confess the faith of our baptism as we say. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord God, you have taught us to pray through your Son, to ask for the things necessary for our lives, to give thanks for its gifts, and to intercede for the needs of the world. Accept what we bring before you this day, the requests of our lips, the works of our hands, and the desires of our hearts that they may be transformed in your sight into gifts acceptable to you. Inspire the church to live in peace, unity, and service, that all who are called by your name may honor you in their lives. Lead the nations of the world in paths of justice and harmony, and direct its leaders, we ask that all people would enjoy the blessings of freedom, stability, and prosperity. Bless all those to whom the life of your church is entrusted, 
for bishops, priests, deacons, that in their lives and in their teaching, your speech to us would be heard. We pray your blessing also on our worship, that in gathering together we would be nourished with your own life. Give all Christians grace, Lord, especially we who worship here in this place and online, that we might live lives of holiness and mutual dependence, trusting always in your gracious provision. We ask also for all who are in danger, for those who are afraid, and for those who mourn, especially those mourning the 751 unmarked graves discovered by the Cowess's first Saskatchewan. We pray also for those facing hardship and illness, especially Daisy, Philip, Hunter, Joe, Janie, Grace, Catherine, Marshall, Bob, Hans, Herminia, Dolph, Jennifer, Mark, Beth, and Douglas. And we remember before you those who have died, Louise, Marion, Gay, Carolyn, Paul, Tammy, and Father Ed Jackman. Accept them into the place of rest prepared for all the faithful and raise them on the last day to enjoy the new life with you. Giving thanks for the witness of the saints, the prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and all whose lives have been signs of your presence to us, and giving thanks also for the many gifts we have received from your hands, remembering this week the wedding of Margot and Greg. We entrust all these our prayers to you, Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose spirit we pray. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. He welcomes sinners and invites them to his table. Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and if, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. My brothers and sisters, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace, 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 peace. And peace, the people of grace and may be. Uh, I want to thank Douglas for presiding today and for Lynn for reminding us to discover the rich diversity of the Psalms, the wonder of the Psalms. Thank you. Um, there's been a lot going on as things are opening up again. Uh, this week, well, we had a small funeral, and on Friday we even had a wedding. Imagine that, a wedding. And I know Mike and I are planning some baptism, so the ministry of the church is continuing in, even in this time and under these conditions. Well, uh, let me, our warden here, Aaron Isles, to tell you what else is going on this week in this place. Aaron.
Good morning. I'd like to update you on our exciting Narthex Courtyard project. As many of you know, the construction of the courtyard is underway. The patio area has been excavated, and while we have the opportunity, we are doing some remedial work on the pipes that run from the boiler all the way to the childcare centre. They are buried under the courtyard, but they are old, leaky, and are in need of replacement. So we are undertaking this improvement while we're at it. Once this is done, the excellent team at Aldershot Landscape Construction will begin to build the new courtyard space. The back patio will be leveled and the planters constructed. Then we will add the trellis and the beautiful lich gate. The Narthex portion of the project is on a separate timeline and is currently being reviewed by the city for a permit. While we await, we have seen some very lovely designs for a small, elegant elevator for the space. As things begin to reopen and we are able to gather again, it is our hope that by the fall we will have a beautiful new courtyard to use and enjoy for safe community gatherings. Thank you to everyone that has supported this project so far. We are most grateful for your generous contributions. If you would like to make a donation to this project, you can do so on the Grace Church website. Thank you all for your continued support. I hope everyone is keeping well, and I wish you a happy summer. Thank you. Good morning. Well, I have some props with me this week. Um, the first announcement is that uh, if you are a child here or online, we have uh, some Sunday papers to go along with the service uh, each Sunday. They're different each Sunday, and there's, you know, a little comic strip. I don't know if the camera can see this, but it's quite delightful. Um, so those are for coloring for children, and if you want to hear more about that, you can talk to me. There's also online uh, PDF version of that. The second is for our more mature uh, congregants here. Uh, I'll be hosting a book study of this book first, uh, What You Have Heard Is True, by the American uh, novelist and, sorry, not novelist, poet and memoirist, Carolyn Forche, uh, who unexpectedly found a man from El Salvador on her doorstep who asked her if she would come to his country and write about what was happening in the 1970s. So she's written about what happened next. It's a great read. I'm on my second read through. So if you're interested in that, you can talk to me or email me. Um, and then our second book will be uh, also about El Salvador, Oscar Romero, uh, who was actually Archbishop of El Salvador and then subsequently assassinated for his uh, faithful witness to the gospel. That's number two. But focus on this one. If you are going to start reading, we'll be meeting on July 18th over Zoom to discuss. Well, I look forward to chatting with you. Uh, many of the faces I haven't seen for a year or more, so it'll be wonderful to catch up uh, once again. Uh, Grace Church is opening more and more. Each Sunday we're allowed, uh, I think we're allowed 30% of our capacity now, so that's exciting. Uh, to be able to be together in person again. Now let's hear Whitney sing as we prepare for the offertory. Uh, Mozart, Laudate Dominum, praise the Lord. Let's hear Whitney, thank you.
God of wisdom, receive all we offer you this day. Enrich our lives with the gifts of your Spirit, that we may follow the way of our Lord Jesus Christ and serve one another in freedom. We ask this in his name. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right that we should praise you, gracious God, for you created all things. You formed us in your own image. Male and female, you created us. When we turned away from you in sin, you did not cease to care for us, but opened a path of salvation for all people. You made a covenant with Israel, and through your servants Abraham and Sarah, gave the promise of a blessing to all nations. Through Moses you led your people from bondage into freedom. Through the prophets you renewed your promise of salvation. Therefore with them and with all your saints who have served you in every age, we raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Source of life and goodness, all creation rightly gives you praise. In the fullness of time, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He healed the sick and ate and drank with outcasts and sinners. He opened the eyes of the blind and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and to those in need. In all things he fulfilled your gracious will. On the night he gave, he freely gave himself to death. Our Lord Jesus Christ took bread and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine and when he had given thanks to them, he, uh, he, he gave thanks. To, uh, when he had, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. 
whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Gracious God, his perfect sacrifice destroys the power of sin and death. By raising him to life, you give us life forevermore. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Recalling his death, proclaiming his resurrection, and looking for his coming again in glory. We offer you, Father, this bread and this cup. We pray you, send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts, that all who eat and drink at this table may be one body, one holy people, a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, O Father Almighty, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord's Prayer. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I am the bread which has come down from heaven, says the Lord. Give us this bread forever. I am the vine, you are the branches. May we dwell in him as he lives in us.
Let us pray. God of power, we are nourished by the riches of your grace. Raise us to new life in your Son, Jesus Christ, and fit us for his eternal kingdom, that all the world may call him Lord. We ask this in his name. Amen. But may the angels of God watch over you, the Blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints and martyrs pray for you. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always.